school, and the world. Sometimes these editorials oppose the way that the school is being run. Occasionally, school officials will try to shut down or censor student papers if they find their writing embarrassing or offensive. But usually, these disagreements are resolved by discussion. At some colleges, the student newspaper is connected to a professional program in journalism. But most of the time, the idea behind the paper is to get students to research the facts, debate the issues, and learn how to get their opinions expressed. If these students go on to become professional journalists, that is fine, but it is not really expected. You might wonder whether enough things happen at a college to fill out a weekly paper. Yes, indeed, schools and universities reflect the real world. There are often problems with the budget and cuts to programs. New buildings go up or are torn down. Policies change. Tuition goes up. Classrooms become crowded, and personnel come and go. University morale and funding often reflect government policies and social attitudes. These tie the college to the larger world. Editorials often comment on how national and world events affect the university. At the same time, there are many things going on within the university. Construction disturbs classes. Offices are broken into. Computers are stolen. Accidents happen in the parking lot. Students die on the roads during the holidays. Sports teams win or lose. Graduation takes place. Students and instructors win awards. Plays are put on. Distinguished visitors speak. Rock bands are in concert. Then there is always the question of student rights and responsibilities. What kinds of student behavior are unacceptable? Should the university pay attention to student activities off campus? Committees meet with student representation to set guidelines for these matters. Another issue is who sets the agenda for the university. Corporate sponsors today are buying exclusive rights to distribute their products on campus. Governments are expecting universities to follow official policies in order to receive funding. Social groups are demanding that university policies reflect their special interests. So there is no shortage of topics for student journalists to address. Of course, they also write about everything that young people are interested in: music, movies, computers, sports, travel, and pop culture. Student newspapers are an important training group for democracy. They are also very interesting to read. Canadian colleges and universities. Canada has about 50 accredited universities spread across 10 provinces. All except one are primarily government-funded. This means that there is considerable uniformity regarding programs, administration, and policy. Private colleges tend to be smaller and are mostly based on a religious curriculum. Most universities offer programs in the humanities, social sciences, and pure sciences. Many have additional faculties, such as education and physical education. Many programs that lead directly to a position in the workplace are given at community colleges. Community colleges differ from universities because their programs involve job training and practical experience. For example, they might offer courses in areas such as computer programming, journalism, photography, social work, dentistry, and nursing. Their programs are considered to be less abstract and academic than university programs. Many students see university as being more fun than community college. They don't have to worry immediately about getting a job, and the social life is often better at university. However, a university degree may be less likely to lead directly to a job. Nowadays, university programs, which are work-related, such as business administration, education, child studies, and psychology, seem especially popular. Universities, however, were founded mainly as liberal arts institutions. This means that their original intent was to prepare people to be well-rounded human beings and knowledgeable citizens. So, nearly all universities have programs in literature, languages, philosophy, culture. Music, history, and politics, as well as studies that are more job-related. A past BA or BSc degree in Canada is normally three full years of study after secondary school. A bachelor degree with honors includes one more year of study. A master's degree is a further one or two years. A doctorate usually requires four or more years. 
This is similar to the United States, except that their bachelor degree is normally three years, and their master's degree may be up to three years. To gain entrance to university, you usually need to graduate from secondary school with a B average. Some programs will require an A average. Tuition costs have gone up in recent years as governments have handed over less money to colleges and universities. More students now have to work during the school year to pay their expenses. Attending college and university is known to be one of the most carefree periods in a person's life. As long as you keep up with your readings and assignments, you should be able to avoid major difficulties. Facilities for athletics, student radio and newspapers, pubs and lounges, and generally pleasant surroundings make campus life agreeable. It is a good time to make friends, learn new skills, and take calculated risks. Moreover, colleges and universities are a good practical investment as they help to prepare young people for a changing world. Coffee and donuts. Let's go for coffee. All over North America, friends like to meet at the coffee shop. Here, people sit and talk about the day's business, news, and sports, personal concerns, shop talk, or simply gossip. Coffee shops have an informal atmosphere that encourages conversation. You don't have to dress up either. Students drop in wearing T-shirts and blue jeans and sit beside businessmen wearing suits and ties. Many coffee shops are open 24 hours a day, including Sundays and holidays. That way, people who work at night or who have trouble sleeping can drop in at any time. Because coffee and donuts are relatively inexpensive, people feel comfortable sitting for a while, knowing that they are not spending a lot of money. Although coffee and donuts are the main items sold at coffee shops, many also serve other beverages and desserts, and sometimes a light lunch. Many patrons have a favorite kind of coffee or other drink, and will drive past other coffee shops to go to one that serves the flavor they like. Visitors from other countries are often surprised at how roomy these coffee shops can be. Some are as large as regular restaurants. Having a nice bit of space around them encourages people to relax. Some people arrange regular dates and meet every day or every week at the same time. For example, retired friends may get together every weekday morning at 10 a.m. Others stop every morning at the drive-in line to get their coffee for work. Even people who have coffee machines at home or at work like to go to coffee shops to get a special kind of coffee or a favorite treat. It might seem that the business owners would not make much money just selling a few items, but in fact, many coffee shops do extremely well, especially if they are located in a busy traffic area. Then business tends to be steady all through the day. Not only do people come in and sit down, but there is usually a lot of takeout business as well. People go to coffee shops not only to socialize with family and friends, but also to discuss business or treat their employees to a snack. Others go there to read the newspaper or a favorite magazine. Some people even go there to do work. This article was written in a coffee shop. Of course, people who come here usually like coffee and donuts. Coffee is the favorite hot drink in North America, but most shops also serve tea, hot chocolate, and cappuccino, as well as some other cold beverages. Donuts are usually round and are small, deep-fried breads with various toppings. Most donuts have a hole in the middle. Even these holes, which are punched out of the donut, can be sold separately as a kind of mini donut. Everywhere you go in North America, you will see coffee shops. So take half an hour to stop in and relax. You'll enjoy the great North American coffee break. Medical missionary. During the reign of Queen Victoria, 1837 to 1901, British people traveled around the whole world. They charted the seas, mapped out distant countries, and studied plants, animals, and people. They also claimed many lands for England. This kind of international travel was made easier by improved transportation and communication. New inventions such as steamships, trains, telegraphs, and telephones made long distances seem smaller. Of course, people had different reasons for going to distant lands. 
Some were businessmen who saw economic opportunities overseas. Soldiers wanted fame and a chance to enlarge the British Empire. Big game hunters wanted to be the first to shoot strange animals and bring back trophies to England. Scientists intended to study unknown animals and plants. Missionaries planned to be the first to introduce Christianity to faraway people. In 1836, a young Scotsman called David Livingston began to study medicine in Glasgow. Livingston intended to become a medical missionary. This means that he would be a doctor as well as a preacher and teacher. Livingston, 1813 to 1873, came from a poor family. From an early age, he had worked 14 hours a day in a clothing factory for very little pay. But he was determined to learn. He took his books with him to the factory and read as he worked. Then, after work, he would go to his teacher to learn more. Livingston's goal was to teach faraway people about Jesus. However, unlike some missionaries, he was also interested in science, geography, and exploring. He had planned to go to China in 1839, but because of the Opium Wars, no missionaries were being sent there. Instead, he asked to go to South Africa. Europeans had traveled around the coasts of Africa for hundreds of years, but very few white people had traveled inland. A missionary named Robert Moffat, who had begun a mission at Curiman in the interior, inspired Livingston. Livingston arrived in Curiman in 1841. This was the farthest outpost of white settlement, and no one seemed to want to go further inland. Livingston felt that the missionaries should go to the Africans, rather than waiting for the Africans to come to them. With a fellow missionary, he set out. When they came to an African tribe, they would talk to the chief and ask permission to preach to his people. Livingston would also set up a tent and treat the people who had diseases. After a while, he would move on to the next tribe. Once Livingston learned the Bantu language, he would talk to many Africans, but sometimes he needed interpreters. There were many diseases, including malaria and sleeping sickness. Livingston suffered much of his life from river fever. He was also so weak that he rode on the back of an ox. Livingston wanted to stop the slave trade. At this time, the slave trade was the most profitable business in Africa. Livingston hoped that if other kinds of trade were developed, then slavery could be abolished. In order to open up trade, he wanted to find an easy route into the center of Africa. Livingston kept going further into the interior. He was probably the first European to cross the Kalahari Desert before reaching Lake Nagami in present-day Botswana. Not long after, he traveled further inland. He explored the sources of the Zambezi and Kansai rivers and eventually reached the west coast of Africa and Luanda, Angola. Livingston was being criticized for neglecting missionary work in order to explore. Livingston replied that he was opening up the continent for missionaries. Meanwhile, he was becoming famous as a great explorer. The British government commissioned him to explore the Zambezi River. They hoped that ships could sail up the river into the interior. Unfortunately, the Zambezi had too many rapids. However, Livingston did find a route up the Shire River to Lake Nyasa. He continued to struggle against the slave trade, which is now being taken over by Arabs. Livingston died in Africa in 1873. He was the first white man to explore Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Malawi, and surrounding areas. He was not only a great explorer, but also a fine doctor and a good missionary. Nowadays, the countries that Livingston visited are nearly all Christian, just as he had hoped they would be. Favorite Cookies North Americans are known for their sweet tooth. This means that they like snacks with lots of sugar. Americans drink a lot of coffee, tea, and hot chocolate, and usually they have something sweet with their drink. Cookies are one of America's favorite desserts. The word cookie comes from a Dutch word meaning little cake. People from Europe brought their favorite recipes with them when they came to America. The English brought their custom of having tea in the afternoon. Usually with their tea, they would have cakes or biscuits. 
Biscuits are usually hard wafers, like, for example, ginger snaps. In fact, the Italian slang word for Englishmen is cake eater. In the early days, all cookies were homemade. But in the late 19th century, biscuits began to be manufactured in large quantities by machine. In 1912, the National Biscuit Company, Nabisco, in the USA, introduced Oreo cookies. This cookie has a rich cream vanilla filling between two crispy chocolate wafers. This product was designed to meet the demand for an English style biscuit. Oreos were good to dunk in a drink, to eat whole, to eat in parts, or to use in cooking. Oreos have become both America's and the world's favorite commercial cookie. New varieties of Oreos are added regularly to the original product. Although commercial biscuits like Oreos are very popular, many people prefer home baked ones. In fact, there is a whole line of commercial cookies called Home Style, which try to imitate homemade cookies. The most popular cookie in America can be either bought in a package or baked at home. These are chocolate chip cookies. Ruth and Kenneth Wakefield operated the Toll House Inn in Whitman, Massachusetts. One day in 1930, Mrs. Wakefield ran out of baking chocolate for her baking cookies. She broke up a chocolate bar and added the pieces to her cookie mix. She expected that the chocolate bits would melt into the dough when she baked them, but they didn't. Soon, chocolate chip cookies were being made commercially by adding small chunks of chocolate to regular chocolate cookie dough. Lots of people like to make their own by adding commercial chocolate chips to their dough. Now, chocolate chip cookies are the most popular kind of cookie in North America. Over 7 billion are eaten annually here. Half of all the cookies baked in American homes are chocolate chip cookies. Experiments in baking and packaging have led to new kinds of cookies. Recently, soft cookies have become very popular. Since they are packaged in foil, they can stay fresh and soft for many months. It seems likely that the love of cookies will be around for a long time. Video designed by English7levels.com Florence Nightingale It could be said that Florence Nightingale was responsible for inventing modern nursing. Indeed, Nightingale did open up the professions to women generally. Her example and influence during the mid to late 19th century were an important factor in opening doors to women. Nightingale's own life reflects many of these changes. She was born in 1820 and was one of two daughters of a wealthy English family. Her mother was a beautiful society lady who had once turned down a favored suitor because he was not wealthy enough. She wanted both her daughters to be socially popular and to marry rich and important men. Florence's father ensured that she had a good education, but she was frustrated because girls and women were always under parental supervision. She felt called to a life of action, but her family insisted that she divide her time between being with her family and attending social functions. She was not allowed to do anything on her own. When she was 16, Nightingale said that God spoke to her and called her to do his work. But Florence didn't know what work she was being called to do. Years passed away while she sat with her mother and sister, or attended dances and concerts, or traveled to Europe. Nightingale became more angry and rebellious. She offended her family and friends by refusing to marry several prominent men who wanted to marry her. By the time she was 24, she had decided to be a nurse. But how did one become a nurse? At that time, the profession didn't seem promising. The only respectable nurses were those women in religious orders that ministered to the patient's spiritual health, but were not trained in medicine. The majority of nurses were poor, untrained women who were suspected of being too fond of men or alcohol or both. In fact, one hospital preferred to hire unwed mothers as nurses because they had no reputations to lose. Nightingale's family was horrified by her plans. Their opposition delayed her plans but could not stop them. 
In 1850, she visited a hospital in Germany for the first time. In 1853, she was appointed superintendent of a women's nursing home in London. But Florence was still waiting for her true calling. In 1855, the Times of London was printing reports from the Crimean War. France and England were fighting Russia in the Crimean Peninsula. After one Allied victory, the wounded French soldiers were well taken care of, but the wounded English soldiers were left to die. Back in England, there was a public outcry. It was Florence's opportunity. She was soon on her way to Istanbul, Turkey, with 38 nurses. Skutari, Turkey was the hospital where the British wounded were brought. This so-called hospital was a death pit, where 42 out of every 100 men died. The army was unwilling to listen to Miss Nightingale or to let her tend the wounded. She had to wait until conditions became so bad that the regular medical officers were overwhelmed. As soon as the army turned to her, she immediately went to work. She had the entire hospital cleaned, a new kitchen set up, and a good water supply obtained. The death rate dropped to 22 out of every 1,000. Nightingale became famous overnight. Although her efforts in the Crimean War injured her health, she continued her work back in London. She published a 1,000-page report on medical conditions in the British Army, several books on nursing, and her own proposals and suggestions. She also set up a training school for nurses. Long before her death in 1910, she had seen nursing become a well-established profession. Almost single-handedly, she had helped to bring about proper treatment of the sick and injured. Harriet Tubman Before the American Civil War, the economy of the southern states was based on the use of slave labor. The social and political leaders of the Old South were the plantation owners. Many of these owned hundreds of black slaves. The slaves were mainly used to pick crops, like cotton and tobacco. Harriet Tubman was born in 1820 in the state of Maryland. As a girl of seven, she was sent into the fields to work with the adult slaves. The slaves worked from sunrise to sunset, picking the crops. Often they sang songs while they worked. Slaves were not taught to read or write. It was feared that reading and writing would help slaves to escape the plantations. Harriet Tubman was illiterate. Later in life, when she was in danger of being captured, she picked up a book and pretended to read it. This fooled the bounty hunters. When she was 15, Harriet helped another slave to escape. The overseer was so angry with her that he hit her over the head with an iron weight. Harriet was knocked unconscious for many days. All the rest of her life she suffered from headaches and sudden sleeping spells. Harriet escaped from the plantation to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Since Pennsylvania was not a slave state, Harriet was fairly safe there. She was able to return secretly to the plantation and bring the rest of her family to freedom. There were already people working to bring black slaves up from the south to freedom. These people, both white and black, used the language of the railroad. Escaped slaves were called passengers. Safe houses were called stations and the guides were called conductors. Harriet soon became a conductor in the Underground Railway. In 1850, the American government passed a second Fugitive Slave Act. This put more pressure on northern states to return escaped slaves to the south. Because of this, the Underground Railway went further north to Canada. In 1793, Upper Canada, Ontario, had passed a law bringing a gradual stop to slavery. In 1834, slavery was abolished in the whole British Empire. A lot of escaped slaves had come to Canada before 1850, but now nearly all escaped slaves tried to go there. Harriet Tubman rented a house in St. Catharines, Ontario. This provided a shelter for new arrivals. Harriet made about 11 trips from Canada to the U.S. during these years. In all, she brought back about 300 people. Escaped slaves had to travel by night and suffered hardships in bad weather. They had to hide during the day wherever they could. 
Harriet did not allow any passengers to turn back. That might endanger the whole underground railway. When the slave owners heard about Harriet, they offered a reward for her capture, but no one caught her or turned her in. When the Civil War broke out in 1861, she acted as a spy for the northern states. After the war, she married a black American soldier, Nelson Davis. In 1869, a book was written about Harriet Tubman. Black slaves knew Harriet as Moses. The Bible tells the story of how Moses led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He led them north to Palestine. In the same way, Harriet Tubman delivered many of her people from slavery and led them north to freedom. Hernias repaired here. A hernia occurs when there is a tear or weakness in the muscle layers of the abdomen. This allows the intestines to push forward into the gap. Usually, the person feels some discomfort and may notice an egg-shaped swelling. In a few cases, the muscle layers may clamp down on the protruding intestine and cut off its oxygen supply. This can result in death if medical help is not readily available. Hernias are more common in men than women, and are often related to lifting heavy materials. Although most hernias are not a serious threat to health, they usually get worse over time. The only cure is surgery to repair the cut, tear, or weakness. As with any surgery, time in a hospital is usually required for recovery. This proved to be a problem in Canada during World War II. Many young men were declared unfit for military service because they had hernias. During the war, there was a shortage of doctors and beds for hernia repair. A Toronto doctor, Dr. Edward Shouldice, decided to address this problem. He personally operated on 70 of these young men using a technique of his own. This Shouldice technique allowed the patients a quicker recovery time than the usual method. It also had a much lower rate of complications and failures. After the war, Dr. Shouldice opened his own hernia clinic for the public. In 1953, a second hospital was started in Thornhill, just north of Toronto, and today all surgery is done there. The Shouldice Hospital is located on a beautiful piece of land with a valley on one side and a golf course on the other. The large grounds have wonderful gardens and flowering trees. There are nature paths for patients to walk on. The building itself is not a regular hospital, but more like a hotel or residence where patients can play the piano, shoot pool, play shuffleboard, or practice their putting. The hospital now has 89 beds, and an average of 30 hernia operations are performed daily. Since all the surgeons are specialists, their level of skill is very high, and less than one percent of operations need to be corrected. The worldwide rate of failure is around 20 percent. For patients, the good news is that everything at the hospital is directed to repairing their hernia and aiding their recovery as quickly as possible. The staff encourages its patients to walk and exercise within four or five hours of surgery. Patients usually stay on for several more days until they are fully recovered and ready to go home. Shouldice's best advertisements are his satisfied customers. Hernia patients come not only from Canada and the United States, but also from many countries of the world to receive the best possible treatment. Shouldice remains the most famous hospital in the world, devoted entirely to the repair and treatment of hernias. Julie Andrews. Julie Andrews, born Julia Elizabeth Wells, was born on October 1, 1935. She lived in a small town called Walton on the Thames in England, which is south of London. Her father Ted Wells was a teacher, and mother Barbara was a pianist and piano teacher. She also played piano for her sister's dancing school. Julie learned ballet and tap as a toddler from her aunt Joan Morris. By the time Julie was three, she could read and write. When Julie was four, her parents divorced, and Barbara married Ted Andrews, a performer during the war and an excellent tenor. He soon began giving Julie 